Hello and welcome fellow coders. Today I'm going to talk about type conversions, so converting between numbers and strings and stuff. For those of you who are new to this channel, my name is Thomas and I'm doing this epic Golang beginners tutorial. So if you want to learn how to write code in Go, then you have come to the right place. And also follow me on my social media, so you can stalk me in my personal life. Ok, enough chit chat, let's get into it. Type conversions. What exactly is that and why do we need it? Loosely speaking, time conversion means converting one data type into another data type. From my last video, you already saw that Go has a lot of different basic types like int, bool, float and string. And sometimes you need to convert between these types. Like for instance, if you have the word false in a sentence, but now you want to interpret it as a boolean value. For that, you need to convert the word false to an actual boolean type. Or something that comes up a lot is the other way around. If you have information in any shape or form and you want to write it to a file, you need to convert it into a byte array first. But why is conversion even needed in Go? Golang is a strongly typed language. That means that every single variable has an explicit type at any single point in time. So for instance, if you define a variable as an int, it will be an int for the whole time the variable exists. That is one of the reasons why Golang is so fast. The compiler of Go always knows what type and variable is, so it does not have to guess or find out first. But the drawback now is, if your variable has one type and you need another, you have to convert it. But before we get into that, let me first show you how you can check the type of a variable in Go. You can use the printf function of the format package. As an argument, you need to provide a string containing so-called verbs. In our case, since we want to print out the type of a variable, we will use the t-verb. But now, you also have to pass in the variable you want to print the type out for. In our case, it's i. See, we get int as our type of a variable i. To get rid of the percent sign, we can add the line break at the end of our format string. So simply add the slash n at the end, run the code again, and there you go, a clean output. Let us add the v-verb that will print out the variable in its default format. Meaning a string as a word, an integer as an integer, a floating point number as a floating point number. But as you can see my IDE complains that there is something wrong with the printf function. It tells us that it expects two arguments, but we are only providing one. Just for the sake of it, let's print our code and see what happens. It prints out the variable i as 1. And it also prints out that the argument for t is missing. And since we want to know the type of i, we need to pass it again. Now if you run the code we get the value 1 followed by its type int. We will use that print function a lot in this section, so I want to show you how it works first. But now we can finally talk about conversions. First, let us talk about conversions of numeric types. Converting numeric types works by taking the basic type you want to convert your variable into and just use it as a function. For instance, if you want to convert your int into an int64 type, simply use the int64 function and the result will be an int64. Let's store that into a variable called c for converted and pass it into the print function. See, now the type is an int64. Keep in mind though that types have a minimum and a maximum value. So if you convert a number that is too high or too low for a given type, the value will wrap around. Since 128 is the maximum number of the int8 type, passing in 129 into the int8 function will result in the minimum value. The same is true if you try to convert a signed number into an unsigned one. See, the value will wrap around as well. Make sure to keep this in mind. Now converting to floats basically works the same way. Simply use the float32 or the float64 function to convert integer values to floating point values. That's pretty straightforward, right? But converting floating point numbers back to integers can be quite problematic, because you will lose the precision the floating point number provides. Let's see what happens if you declare f as a float64 with the value 3.14 and then try to convert it into an integer value using the int function. If you print that out you can see that the decimal places all have been dropped. And that is actually no rounding up or down. If we change the number to 3.8 and run the code again, it still cuts off every decimal numbers. So remember, if you want to preserve decimal places, always use the floating point types. And that is basically it for converting numeric types to other numeric types. Now let's find out how to convert numbers and strings. Converting between numbers and strings happens a lot when you write applications. So knowing how to do that properly is pretty important. Let's first talk about how to convert numbers to strings. In case you want to convert an integer number to a string, the Golang library provides us with a built-in function from the stringconf package, which is the iota function. First let us define an integer value again and then use the iota function to convert it. See, the output tells us that the variable indeed is a string. This works for positive values as well as negative ones, as long as you use a regular int value. So if you define i as an int64 variable, the compiler complains that the iota function only accepts int type arguments. And that might already raise the question, what about floating point numbers? Well, it is true that you cannot use the iota function to convert any other types other than int, but fear not. 
Using the same string conf package you have a lot more options. If you type in format, you can already see that my IDE suggests me a bunch of functions that help me convert other types to string. Like for instance the format float function. If you try to use it, you can see that it asks for four arguments. First the float value itself, next the format, which I will come to in a second, the third argument is the precision, so how many decimal places you want your string to have, and the last argument is the bit size, which is either 32 or 64 for float 32 values or float 64 values respectively. Now let's talk about the format argument. If you have a look at the documentation of the format float function, you can see that the format is one of these values right here, depending on the format you want your string to be in. So let's go with the simplest route and use f, which is the point notation. First let's change our variable type to float and then pass it into the format float function. Use f as the format and let's take the precision 4 and the bit size 64. If you now print that out, you can see that the string representation has 4 decimal places and the variable type is indeed string. So this seems to work perfectly. Now let's have a look at the format int and the format uint functions. Both take an int64 value as the first argument and the base as the second. Let's first change the variable to an int64. So now you can convert your number to binary using the base2, an octal using the base8, hexadecimal using the base16, or what you will probably do in most cases, convert it to a decimal representation using the base10. Which is the equivalent to the iota function I was talking about earlier. So in most cases you will use the iota function. If you look at the documentation, you can see that you can even put in values between 2 and 36. But you will hardly use any other types than the ones I just showed. So that is it for converting numbers to strings. To convert strings to numbers, you can use the string conf package as well. This time though by using the parse functions. Again, if I type in parse you can see that my IDE already suggests me the parse functions of the string conf package. So let us take parse float as our first example. You can see that it takes two arguments. First the string of the number I want to parse and second the bit size, which again is either 32 or 64. If we try to store the result of the parse float function to a variable, you can see that the compiler tells us that it cannot initialize one variable with two values. This means that the parse float function actually returns two results. So we need two variables to store the complete result of the parse function. The first one is the resulting floating value and the second one is an error in case the conversion went wrong. I know that we did not talk about functions yet, but I'm sure you can understand what I'm trying to explain here. First let me remove the integer value and then let's just print out the value as well as the error. This will make it much clearer. If you run the code you can see that the number gets parsed and the error is nil. Nil means that there actually was no error. If you try to parse something that is definitely not a number like hello, you can see that the value that got printed out is the zero value of the floating type. And this time the error is not nil, but rather the error explains in a more or less cryptical way that the parsing of hello failed. This is the go way of making sure that you only pass in strings with valid numbers. Let us next look at other parse functions like parseInt and parseUint. Same as the parseFloat function, they both return two values, the result of the parsing and an error in case of a failure. And both of these functions take three arguments, the string representation of the number to parse, the base and lastly the bit size. Same as for the format functions, the base determines the base of the number and the bit size determines, well, the bit size. So for example, if you pass in a string holding the binary representation of a number, use the base2 and the bit size 64, that will pass the string to its decimal number. Same as for the format function, the parse function also has a short version for parsing numbers with a base 10. And that function is called atoy, which returns an integer value and an error. So when converting numbers to strings and vice versa, in most cases you will use the i to a as well as the a to i functions of the string conf package. So make sure to remember them. One less common thing is converting boolean values, but nonetheless let me quickly show you how it's done. As you might have already seen, you can use the parseBool function to parse strings to boolean values, as well as the formatBool function to convert boolean types to strings. After all that you have learned, that is actually pretty straightforward, right? One last conversion I want to talk about is the conversion of strings and byte arrays. This is very important because both types are heavily used in the Golang programming language, or in programming in general. Basically everything you store on your hard drive or transport over the internet is translated to bytes first. That is why functions in Go oftentimes either take byte arrays as an argument or return byte arrays as a result. If you want to convert string to a byte array, you can use the byte array function to do that. Running this example prints out a sequence of 5 bytes. And as you can see the type is an array of u and 8s, hence bytes. So a byte array. Every single element represents one character of the hello string. Converting that byte array back to a string can be done using the string function. Alrighty, we just converted the string to an array of bytes and back to a string. 
If you start writing applications in Go, you will use these two conversions a lot. And that was it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you want more Golang tutorial videos like this, please give this one a like. And of course, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Until next time, keep on coding.